Hi there, I'm Karen Dunn of KMD Productions. From the equipment manufacturers to the engineers to the business people behind the scenes. Over the years, every member of the Pro Audio Corner of the music industry have become family to me. And it's my job to bring the whole eclectic crew together. Each episode, I'll introduce you to one of these characters and open a window into my world of creating community in Pro Audio. Thanks for tuning in to One and Done. Uh, today's guest is Tom Kenny. He's the uh, editor of Mix Magazine, and uh, he's been an editor for a couple decades. So, okay, the story I always hear when we meet someone new or I'm meeting someone no- new that you know, you always tell them how you got hired at Mix. So you want to yeah. talk uh, about that? Yes, it's, uh, I got hired by you, Kara Dunn. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it is funny. I, I, out of graduate school, I uh, was at Indiana University. And back in those days, I had a Word 3.0 program. And I did a tab delimited mailing list to 120 publications in the Bay Area, thinking I wanted to live in the Bay Area and move out. And I mailed them. And out of 120, some, uh, 10 came back. And one of them was mixed. David Schwartz was the founder, co founder. Okay. And, uh, editor of mix at the time and he was from fort wayne indiana and went to indiana university and saw my resume it was one of the ones to write so um i came on that summer after graduate school and i i don't know if you remember this but uh you were an assistant editor or associate i can't remember and i was working with five dollars an hour for proofreading and i had my master's degree but i liked it and but it was the summertime and i was an independent contractor because you didn't have any positions and I got my work from you. I would come in and sit in a corner with Ed Bedparath and a couple others. Uh-huh. And, um, and proofread, just mix an electronic musician all day long. And I liked it. <laughs> but at the same time, I had a, a wife at the time, and she was going to go to grad school at Mills College, and I had to make a living. And so I interviewed for a bunch of jobs when I got out here, and I had a public relations job that summer that was offering me I remember at the time it's 1988 and they were offering me $32,000 a year to start, but my clients would have been Chevron, uh, the board of regents at the university of California and, uh, a business round table of California. And these are all like with my political views and the way I was raised, that would not have been a happy time for me. So it was either 32,000 or $5 an hour. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, uh, I, and I had this decision. I really liked Mix. I liked the music. I liked the team there. And and then a job opened up right at the end of summer, right when I had to make the decision. And you said to me, Mix, you know, $1,100 a month, and you can be an editorial assistant. And uh, I was thinking, $13,000 a year. Oh, my gosh. Um, and then you said, came back to me the next day and said, we could give you 1200 a month. And I said, okay. I took it. And so I took mix over uh, PBN Public Relations, Peter B. Deckenhauser, and uh, and I've never for a minute regretted the decision. And thank you for hiring me, Karen Dunn. <laughs> yeah. One of my best hires ever. Uh, so you've day. been in, yeah, you've been in pro audio forever. So what does community mean to you? Uh, and and secondly, and how do you see Mix's place in the pro audio community? So it's a two part yeah. question. Oh, wow. Um, community, it's uh, its one of those words that uh, out here in the early 1990s, like the first round of the internet, uh, when we had modems and everything, the word community was brought up a lot in those corporate meetings. And, and it became as fu- it quickly became this like ugly term. It was like a, a, a sort of a, a bastardized marketing term or something. And people dismissed community. And it's come back. And I, I, it's so essential. Um, I mean, the idea of, uh, I'm Irish, so you have an immediate community. Uh, if your name's Kenny, you have an immediate Irish community. I come from a large family community. I uh, was in a fraternity community. And then um, Pro Audio, I mean, that, that was it. I didn't know much about Pro Audio when I came here. And it's it's a tight community, large enough uh, to cover the world and a small enough community that you can have a nice dinner at any time right. with a person in pro audio and that's your small community there but it's something i learned i mean i didn't i didn't know a thing about pro audio when i joined 
and I, and I learned it, and uh, I've always enjoyed it because one, it's a, it's a creative community, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it has technology. So they're they're thinkers. They're they're pointing toward the future, and at the same time, they're artists. Uh, even people who you know, people who work for manufacturers are artists. They play guitar. It's a, right. it's a combination of the community. It's like all the left brain, right brain people gathered and decided to go into pro audio. And it's kind of a, it's kind of fun that way. So I, I love the community. I mean, I've, I've grown up in it over half my life now, and right. uh, never, never looked back. So do you? Uh, oh, Mix's place. That was yeah. the second part. Uh, mix. I've, I better mention Mix in this. Um, uh, mix is to me. I didn't know much about the trade press, and you realize when you get out into the world that uh, every industry has its sort of voice, as its uh, has its beacon or whether it's a magazine, a newsletter, a, a voice, a blogger, uh, anything, it's a, it, it provides that access to the industry. And that was a word that always hit me when I was a young, a young lad, as Paul Podian used to call me, young Tom, um, it, that Mix provides that access for the community. It, it, that's the role that it's always played for me. Uh, not many people get to go to the Village Recording Studio. Not many people get to, you know, had the privilege to visit Hit Factory New York, but if you could bring that to them in a little bit, there's a there's a large world out there. You know, at the beginning, forty five thousand readers of the magazine. How many get to go into Criteria, or how many get to visit Record Plant, or? Uh, but that's the access, and it's a it's an aspiration, and so Mix's role in the community is really to provide that sort of look at look at the industry, uh, it, it, an overview of the industry, to provide access for everybody who wants to enter and anybody who wants to learn. So. Right. So do you incorporate that vision of community into your writing at all? Uh, Does it influence I it? I don't know. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, like, because one, you, you, um, you write for an audience. I mean, uh, it's interesting it makes that you need to, we assume you have some knowledge. And that's different right. than a, a newspaper, a, a magazine you might find at the grocery store, anything like that. Mix has an assumed knowledge in the industry. I mean, based on that community, you can uh, you can say uh, uh, you can have shorthand information that it presumes an insider information. You have an audience that wants to be there, right. uh, and and they've looked up. And Mix has been a powerful the the, the the Mix voice or the Mix brand has. I could call up. I was always amazed as a young lad that I could. Uh, call up Disney post-production studios and I could go in because Disney has an interest in the sound community. Yeah. You know? right. um, I could call in and I could find out and they didn't know me, but everybody, you know, I could call a studio in Kansas, Washington, DC, Miami, Tampa, and I could, I could visit and they welcomed it. And to me, it's like, it's a little bit like family. I'm a big family right. man. So, I mean, it's, it's like, there's a, once you're inside that, sense of community and you have the privilege of being the editor of mix uh you're part of the family and, and that's always been special so i know i know you're a big family guy you've got a couple daughters mm -hmm. and you're from a family of 10 brothers and sisters right 12 uh, 12 a, oh. a dozen yeah i'm one of 12 yeah okay where are you in the 12 uh, I like tell uh, math. I mean, I'm, I can't be in the middle, but I'm sixth, so I'm I'm a middle okay. child. The twelfth, okay. the, the forgotten one in the middle, the one, <laughs> the one that has to the one that has to get along with everybody. Yeah. And uh, do you think um, growing up in a family like that influenced your whole feeling of community? Yeah. I talked to Chris Rodriguez the other day, and so he was talking about when we were talking about community. Family for him is a huge community. His family. Yeah. So Absolutely. how is that? And do you think it influenced your choices? Going yeah. forward, I mean, a, a, certainly. Uh, I I I don't dislike anybody in the world. I mean, I, I like people. I like being around people. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, there's sort of I, in a family of twelve, I mean, we, we get along remarkably well. I mean, to this day, we gather for large reunions. My parents are still alive. I'm fortunate. They're, my mother turned eighty-five yesterday. Great. Uh, happy birthday, Mary. And um. And my father's 88 and it's it's irish and raised catholic in a small town in indiana i mean it doesn't get any more family than that you know i, right. I knew very few divorced kids i knew any of that for better or worse i don't i don't judge that i just uh you know that was my sense of family and uh you know you met at dinner you ran around with your brothers you played capture the flag and and you got 
you realize that the group was important. I mean, if there's one thing that I sort of marked that I'd want to pass on to my children is some sense of humility that we're all part of this world. We're all part of this community. We help each other out. And uh, you know, there's no, like, always, you had to help out your brother, you had to help out your sister, you, you had your chores to do. Uh -huh. There's a sense of sort of responsibility and trust. And I think those are both key, the key elements to any community that, uh, one, you get along, <laughs> uh, two, you, you laugh together. I think that's an important part of any community. Right. And uh, in three, you know, you're still interested in each other after many years. And I, I bless that in my family. And then I do have two daughters, and they're both wonderful. Um, adult women uh, living wonderful lives right now. Uh, one's in Toronto. Molly, the oldest, is a midwife in Toronto. Uh, married to Nick. Uh, and has two children. And Jessie is in museum studies here in Oakland, California with me. She got her master's in museums and worked at the San Francisco Airport Museum and is now in that limbo that we're all in. But right. uh, with a wonderful guy named John. And family's important to them. Yeah. So... It's interesting you're talking about family and the being together and a whole bunch of you, but you chose swimming as a sport. So, <laughs> yes. so swimming, even though it's a team, it's an individual sport yeah. also. So explain that. Uh, well, first well, tell what everybody I, what you swam and, and uh, okay. So yeah, I, I love history. swimming. swimming. Swimming was a big part. Talk about community. You have a, you know, a summer swim team in Rensselaer, Indiana. There'd be a hundred kids from, eight and under to 15 to 19. And, you know, you go up the ladder, there's a hierarchy. You have people whose records you want to beat. And so you join the summer swim team and those are your people. Uh, that's what you did, and especially in small town Indiana in the 70s. And uh, so that's some success. And I, I don't know, I played baseball, I played basketball as a sport. If you have seven brothers, you play, yeah. you end up with sports. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, can't, you can't really avoid it. And uh, but I swimming as a tattoo. What I I don't know. I mean, haven't thought about this in a while. Probably the solitude when you uh, yeah. you know, if you're when the there's six so many 12, of you, yeah. Your entire, <laughs> your entire life is noise and people, and you never had a you know, I never had not had a roommate. I never not I always had a roommate every every uh, year of my growing up. And uh, it's swimming. There's something sort of uh, 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 really hypnotic about going up and down and looking at that black line in the bottom and doing your flip turn and metronomic and i used to count my strokes and it sort of became my meditation i would think in a way and uh but also just incredible physical exercise i love swimming i mean at the same time you have this individual sort of uh, performance you are you're there at the edge of the pool rooting for the, the third place guy in the hundred yard backstroke you know you're rooting for him because your team could beat valparaiso that day and uh that's a giant deal. It's so yeah. individual achievement. I think that we do. I think the world is full of superstars. I, I've met a number of them in pro audio. And you love your, you love your stars and your heroes. And that's the, that could be great to have individual performance. But if you're not rooting for the, the kid in lane six on the breaststroke at, at the end of the meet to help, help you beat, you know, then that kid realizes he's important too. There's one point right. back there is, is important right. and, uh, to me swimming has that you know i'm allowed to be by myself i'm allowed to perform how i kind of selfish side of me i guess and then um you, you got to be buddies with the kid in lane six right yeah i learned i was always in team sports and i think one thing that i learned that's influenced everything is that there are gonna be people on your team that you don't really like or get along with yeah. but yeah. you have to learn how to work with them because you have a common goal right absolutely so so that's really influenced a lot of what I've done since then. Yeah, and, um, and you're never in a small in a small group like that. You're never whether it's an office or the bank or whatever. I mean, you're not. Uh, there's going to be people who don't match your beliefs, your styles, right. your your way of working. I mean, I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> that pisses off a lot of people. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But I get things done, and um, and I'm part. Of, I, I love. I used to love the editorial meetings at Mix every Tuesday morning at ten thirty, and I'd bring a, a dozen donuts in a pink box, and it, uh -huh. I re I realize that little group at Mix um, of you know, Blair Jackson, Paul Putty, George Peterson, you in the beginning, Karen, uh, Barbara Schultz, Sarah Jones. I and I walk in with the pink box, and over those years, I I realized I've spent more than eight thousand dollars on donuts. <laughs> For a, 
<laughs> for my community you know, every Tuesday. I was, I was a yeah. managing editor and then the editor. I brought him. It became a thing. But even the donuts were important to the community. Yeah. Uh, talk about community. At a church, a lot of, you know, if you grow up in a, a household, you go to church, the, the basement in the church on a Sunday morning. I mean, you couldn't wait to get out of the pew and you'd run down and get donuts and coffee. Um, feasting is a part of community. You right. know, feasting, celebration, and, uh, and dinner, and awards shows, and uh, all the, all these are based on community, you know, gathering. Right. Yeah, I was going to talk a little bit more about mix, but we'll come back to that because you mentioned tech awards. So uh, you and that's I. That's part of mix. A big part yeah, of mix. but but it was it's its own community that oh. is part of mix. So you and I worked on that together for a long time. You were in as you wrote the scripts. Yeah. You were a stage manager. You were a troubleshooter. Um, and some of the best days of my life were at the Tech Awards. Yeah, yeah. They were fun. They were a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Is there? Do you, what are some of your favorite stories that can be shared? Um, I mean, just first of all, I'd never been to a ballroom with eight hundred people, like in reverence of something, you know, or wanting to give out awards or wanting to hear a speech. I mean. I'd watch things on TV, but at that, you know, when you're 26, not a part of a big industry or something, you know, you don't see that. So my first impression was, wow, uh, this is big. And I'm standing next to Tom Dowd or, or right. Bruce Swedeen or, or Al Schmitz here, uh, the Giants. I mean, they, they all came out in the, the Tech Awards. But I got I to gotta step back a minute and go, the first thing is that sort of formed my impression at Mix is, when you say the Tech Awards, uh, people think it's about technology only. And, uh, but uh, the TEC stands for Technical Excellence and Creativity. And, right. and it was a founding, is a sort of the founding concept of the Tech Awards, as I understand it. I came in a little after you, and I came mm -hmm. in when it was five, five years in or something like that. And, um, but it was Technical Excellence and Creativity. And that part is so crucial because they don't just honor the technology, they honor the people, they honor the engineers. They honor the manufacturers. They honor the, uh, the film mixers. They honor the the mastering engineers. They honor the whole community. And that that idea of you have to have technology, technical excellence, and you have to have that sort of right brain, nutso creativity is the community. I mean, that's the ethos of the community. And the right. tech awards symbolize that more than anything it, it, to me. It, it'd be you know, 28, 29 years old and put on a tuxedo. I had to rent. That's the first time I ever wore a tuxedo in my life. Um, was at the Biltmore Hotel, probably. <laughs> but I, I told the story. I mean, one of my favorite memories of all to start out of is uh, at the Biltmore. And I'm, it was early on. And I knew Ed, Ed Cherney, the late Ed Cherney. Mm -hmm. And he became a friend of both yours and mine. And uh, it's very early on. And Rose Mann's there. And she's the head of record plant, for goodness sake. And I know enough to, to know who these people are in the industry. But I'm suddenly there working with you behind the scenes. And the, the event is over. It's wonderful. And i uh, having a cocktail and, I, and I'm with Ed and Rose and they, they're just talking like friends. And right. I, and I know enough to know that I'm like, golly gee, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Jones, I'm just happy to be here. Uh, it was immediately accepted. It was immediately accepted. And, and it went on from there. And I met the celebrities, you know, I got the, uh, <laughs> so many, as many of the stories I couldn't tell here, but uh, Les Paul, I mean, you know, we create the Les Paul award and Les is there till one in the morning at the after party, he just sit with people. I mean, people yeah. can walk up, Les will talk to him. Sometimes had a Budweiser in his hand, sometimes flirted with the ladies, but Les was, a, yeah, <laughs> Les was a great guy. Uh, Stevie Wonder came to the after party and stayed till two in the morning, yeah. talking to everybody. Uh, and Stevie Wonder shook my hand on the way out. After, it was only the second time I'd met him in my life. And I remember him coming out at one thirty at the Marriott Marquis, and like, uh, I forget what floor we were on, but it was one of the the after party floor where we got the big suite. Right. And Stevie has a couple people. And he just, I said, thank you so much, Stevie. He says, God bless you, Tom. And first of all, I didn't even, uh, you know, he was ignorant enough to know that, how does Stevie don't remember my name? Uh, but it was just a moment where you go like, wow, he doesn't, he doesn't have to know my name. But that's again, pro audio, music, the creative, the recording community, they're, they're welcoming. It's very welcoming in this Yeah. Uh, I remember standing next to Janet Jackson when she's going to present to uh, to uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. I think it was. Am I right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, and 
who stand inside the stage and she's she looks like Janet Jackson. I mean, it's unbelievable. Right. And, um, and, and she's like dancing quietly and like fidgeting. And, and, and she's about to go on the MC. I forget who it was, there, but I was about to call her on. And I go, are you nervous? I go, yeah, this will be easy. This audience will love you. This is, you've been in Rio. You know, you played to a, and she goes, I've never not been nervous when I've gone on any stage. And I go like, oh my gosh. This is Janet Jackson, and she's in front of an audience, and she's nervous as can be. And she pulled it off brilliantly, yeah. of course. But um, and uh, you know, it's dear sweet. And she's her her honesty there to Jimmy and Terry was just it's it's fun to see. Yeah. I mean, there's other a million things. I got the, I mean, spending an afternoon to hang with Tom Dowd uh, as we're doing rehearsal on the Saturday afternoon. Tom Dowd says things like, "It's a gas, Tom. It's a gas," and I go like. Tom Dowd just said, it's a gas. He was like the coolest guy. Like a 1950s jazzer or whatever. Yeah. It was so much fun. Yeah. I mean, Dom, Dom was giving a, the tribute speech to Brian Wilson, right, at the same year that the documentary came out about Brian. That that stream of consciousness, acid poetry, tribute speech by Don, to this day, how many people have seen it? It was brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a thousand moments like that. Do you yeah. have a favorite moment? Uh, I, <laughs> two, two, but I can't tell either one of them here. Um, <laughs> uh, I, there was a moment um, when Father, <laughs> just as a, from the stage manager side, and from I mean, from being there five feet away, but nobody can see you, mm -hmm. um, you know, and witnessing it was a, it was when the AES was. It was I don't even I don't even know if it's a favorite, but it's so remarkable. And um it was a long show, we got over time, and we were at the St. Francis in San Francisco. This is when mm -hmm. the AES was in San Francisco for a while. And there was um and Father Guido Sarducci was our host, and it was one of the early ones. And George Martin, you know, the one amazing Sir George, um uh was the the Hall of Fame uh -huh. honorary, I believe, that year. Yeah. And and Father Guido, and we were running long. And as you can tell, when you're backstage, you can tell the audience is getting tired. We're out of wine. There's 800 people here. They all want to leave, but they really can't. And, uh, and Father Guido popped up on stage. It goes uh, but off the cuff. And I do this. I've been hanging with him for four hours. And, uh, he goes, ladies and gentlemen, and he's in the full regalia. And he goes, I did not know tonight when I came that I'd have George, George Martin in the audience. And I would... Uh, I've just always wanted to do this, and he, boom, and he led into like a 60-second Beatles medley of, uh, in almost, uh, he just rifted off a cappella at the mic to close the show, and it was brilliant. It wasn't it was planned. Yeah. And, uh, and George Martin was at the table, like in the front row, and I happened to be by the stage, and he came around my partition when Father Guido said, good night, everybody, see you next year. And, uh, and they met a foot from me, and George George Martin hit a beeline. Father Guido had just stepped off the stage. He said, oh, Father, Father Guido, that is the, like, the best. I've heard a thousand Beatles medley imitations. That's the best one I've ever heard. And, it, and they hugged. And, everything, and, I, and then they were gone. And uh, you say, wow, that, that just happened. Uh, nope. And I felt like I was the, uh, probably the only person in the world who saw that. But it was absolutely magic. And the tech awards, I, I, I have a... 200 of those if I sat down for yeah. a, a few pints with you but um and that's it, um and I I'm a humble guy I'm not I'm not one who's like is enamored but it, it just I've been privileged in my position at mix to be able to to meet those type of uh, brilliant people brilliant people not, I think that there the issue has always been trying to get people to understand what the tech awards are that feeling in the it, room yeah so if you something. can convince them to go they never not want to go, uh, it's but it's something. To... Yeah, it's unlike anything I've ever experienced. Well, they, had, they had one. We had one year. I remember with Phil Spector. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and um, and uh, to this day, I think it's the only recording that doesn't exist of it. It is. Yeah. It is, and it's. I think what you like, but um, <laughs> he, it's sort of. But he hadn't appeared in public a lot before that. This was before, obviously, everything happened, but um. He had to be Republican, so there's some skepticism about he showed us on trash. And he gets up, but we didn't know what his speech would be about. Right. And he didn't come to rehearsal. Um, and then he uh, he got up on stage, and uh, we're all wondering what's going to happen. 
right. to accept this Hall of Fame award. Phil Spector deserves a Hall of Fame award, for goodness sake. And, um, and his opening joke, I remember this, his opening joke was, what do you get when you cross John Denver and Michael Bolton? There's a pause. There's 800 people out there. There's a pause. He goes, Barney. And the, yeah, the dinosaur. Uh, right. But the, the audience is like, what? And, it's eight, and a room of 800 people who are perplexed is noticeable. And then he went on for like 20 minutes, I remember, yeah. uh, basically berating the music industry, the record industry, the recording industry, how nothing was better than it was. And just like essentially told them all they were like, <laughs> you guys are terrible. And then, um, and then for 30 seconds after, after like, just blast him. He goes like, but I love the record industry. I love music. And then 800 people give me a standing ovation. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like sitting there, I'm, I'm sitting there I'm clapping. Going, it's almost, the show's almost yeah. over, but you guys realize he just insulted all of you. Um, but it's magic. I mean, because there's yeah. a, there's a love in the room. I mean, there's a, in that room, like uh, you're talking about that bring up that story because there is, it's a magical feeling. Uh, if Phil Spector wants to rant and then tell you all he loves you, that's a good night, yeah. you know. Yeah. That's a good night. Yeah. So, did you were you there for the um, Neil Young? Yeah. So same uh, kind of thing where he ranted. Yeah, and he went on to well, and he's Neil Young. He can do that. Yeah. I mean, honestly, <laughs> it's his one chance. I mean, I don't, I don't have any problem about that. It, it, Neil no, no, no. He had a hard he had to think about high res and analog. And Neil cares. I mean, yeah. that's the one thing. If, you, if they care, you know. It's a good rant. I mean, and nobody left. Nobody left nah. the Phil either. It, those speeches nah. went on for a long time, but nobody moved. Nobody left. No, and it is. Yeah. I mean, did you realize uh, that that's this is the one time they have? I mean, and it's a, to a very special audience. You know, I've. Uh, uh, I. It's funny when I became editor of Mix. I mean, for a long time, Mix didn't allow people on the cover. Uh, it was always a console in the studio. And we honored the studio, but right. And then I changed that I, 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 with a lot of help, but uh, I it put people on the cover, and and I've been I've been amazed. I mean, Celine Dion sat the cover of Mix because she's with Francois, her engineer. Uh -huh. She shows up, showed up like no stylist, no man. <laughs> Celine's on the cover. Steven Tyler, and Joe Perry come over to sit with Jack Douglas between tapings of wow. of uh, American Idol. Was that Steven's show? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't watch. Um, but your tapings in full game. Um, we've had a number of those where the artist, the one that gets a Rolling Stone or a People magazine, will sit with their engineer or producer for mix. And that was that room at the Tech Awards. That was right. Janet wa Janet Jackson wants to come on or Terry and Jimmy. You know, Neil Young wants to talk to that audience yeah. for 20 minutes. And uh, I remember John Byers' speech about wanting to be on a desert island behind barbed wire. That'd be his preferred life with a telephone. But he loved being in the room with those 800 people as well. Yeah. Um, and you realize that's the affection. These, we've, had, we've had George Lucas. I remember standing by Sting at the Tech Awards and looking over at him and going like, my God, you're good looking. Like, <laughs> you're, you're like... You're like, you look like a Greek statue. You're, uh -huh. you're in person, like, wow. Yeah. You know, and, uh, but Sting wants to honor his engineers and producers. Right. You know, he shows up. Uh, yeah. It's remarkable that people, yeah. Brian Wilson shows up. Um, yes, Harvey Hancock. I mean, the legends that have been through the tech awards that, that show up artists and engineers is remarkable. Yeah. And it's, I think it says something about the community. I think it says something right. about pro audio that, the creators know what's important and on their level. I agree. So you were just talking about how the covers have changed in mix um, yeah. from consoles to people. Um, what's it been like shepherding mix through the huge shifts in the print in industry since you started? Yeah. Cause it's definitely a lot different than it was when oh, you first started. Yeah. Uh, the whole media. I mean, it's, uh, that's a whole nother, I could go on for 12 hours on that, but uh, the biggest thing is, uh, just try to narrow down. I mean, we don't have as many pages. Media, I could go on media. Music got hit hard by the internet. Um, it doesn't mean the support isn't there. It doesn't mean the community's not there. I mean, I preside 10 years, uh, the, the decade of the 90s, the go-go 90s, we averaged a 248-page issue a month. I mean, 
And when you manage that, that's a lot of photographs. That's a lot of text. That's a lot. It's a big, my bigger budget. I'd fly around the country. Um, and all that access has changed for the right. I mean, I can, right now we're talking on Zoom. Uh, and, and it's a whole different world. And that it, every bit of change, though, brings a chance to incorporate something else. Now we're doing virtual events. We're doing, I'm having access to Emmy Award winning engineers and uh, you know, Oscar winning award engineers that we're bringing them in from England and we're bringing them in from this. So I, yes, I lament the days of, of a, a big fat magazine, but I also love this opportunities for new media. I mean, if you like technology and you like audio, it's a pretty good time to be alive. You yeah. know, that we're, we're discovering. So the change, I, you know, it, a lot of people have had it worse than me. I, I'm still the head of mix, and we, we're putting out online. We put out newsletters. One thing I laugh about, um, I do a newsletter these days, and it's mixed line. It comes out every Tuesday and Thursday, and I'm back to doing it. You know, I put out the items, and I select the items. But in, 19, in 1991 or 92 at mix, we started uh, mix facts, and it was a facts newsletter. Like uh, facts like the machine? The machine, and you could type in. There's a there's a facility for corporate <laughs> office fax machines where you could dial in a group a group number, and we had 800 people sign up by paper, wow. and we had to go like type, print it out, feed it into a fax machine, a, a weekly newsletter, a mixed fax, and a uh, and a uh, 30 years later, I mean David David Schwartz and Halal Reznor, Halal. People, uh, uh, Hillel Reznor's role in Mix was enormous, and he was a brilliant marketing man, and he was behind the, uh, the tech awards. Uh, and Hillel is one of, uh, lo looking back over, looking back over my career, uh, Hillel's a brilliant man in terms of marketing and reaching audience and knowing that community. Right. And Hillel, they came up with Mix facts. I, I laugh that I, or if I speak in a college or whatever, 30 years later, I, I can push a button faster and I can assemble with apps faster and I can do all that, but the idea is there. The mm -hmm. idea was there to have a, a newsletter that uh, reached the industry, reached the people who needed to have the information. And so the changes are real, but I know that. I mean, I, there's always going to be technology changes. Uh, right. You know, and the magazines will come and go. The magazines will rise and fall. The print will move. I, 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 we have a strong brand at Mix. I'm grateful for that. Uh, fits nice on a on a baseball cap yeah um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to be around the media has changed dramatically I, and, but the, the fundamentals remain the same i mean that yeah. so however we want to reach them i the, my only problem is i don't like being on camera so much so uh so if i have to do all these <laughs> and like, with right, you on there uh and so so the funny thing is it's 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 okay to hide behind words i can write all day i'm, I'm right. up late at night i might write but uh being on camera makes me a little more nervous. Yeah. So what advice would you have for someone interested in music journalism as a career right now? Uh, uh, right, right, right. Uh, because no matter how you want to present yourself, uh, whether you're a, a, a podcaster, whether you're a, a YouTuber, whether you're an influencer, whether you're a personality, whether you're a spokesperson for the industry, uh, you have to communicate. Uh, writing's that fundamental part. So don't give up on writing. I mean, whether it's your emails to your colleagues, whether it's your everything, I mean, think about writing. Um, and I, I, if you want to be a music journalist, um, one, I think you have to know about media and reaching people somewhat uh, right. in whatever form. But I also think if you're music, you, you should know art, you should know film, you should know cooking, you should know, I mean, be broad. I mean, keep your interests Keep your interest broad and wide and don't just don't just say I want to be a music journalist, so I'm gonna do music and journalism. You know, that's that's uh that's not a ticket to a long career. That's a ticket to a I might want to get a job. I didn't I didn't when I joined Mix, I didn't know it'd be my career. Right. But I'm sure glad I am so glad I did. And I'm so glad you hired me, Karen. <laughs> yeah. So you've been in and out of studios, showrooms, trade shows. Yeah. All these yeah. different things. So what's been your, do you have a most memorable moment from all of this? <laughs> the dinners in Las Vegas. Um, <laughs> uh, wow. Memorable. I mean, no, I mean, I wish I had something to say. Like I, 
I saw Stevie Nicks sing Landslide. I don't have that story. Um, <laughs> but let me think. I mean, I, one of my favorite things, I mean, I, I like trade. Trade shows are a big part of my life that I didn't know would be a part of my life. And so you, know, you go see technology. It takes a few years to get to know people and to come around and they shake your hand. They say, Tom, you know, rather than mix. And, um, and once you reach that point, I think it's one of my favorites, I mean, the dinners, I gotta say, I, I, I really enjoy the dinners at trade shows when you've had a long day, um, you might find out some new things, you run across some you know, friends and people you haven't seen for years, but then uh, you, get, you get to sit down, <laughs> you might even still have your backpack with you, uh, you're out of mood, but you're just suddenly, uh, that, that uh, quickie dinner becomes a four hour dinner with a third bottle of wine, good stories you decide to order dessert and then you have a coffee and then you have a port and it keeps going i've had some of my best dinners ever with dan zimbelman from api you know yeah, and, and these i mean I'm, it's hard to pick a top 10 it, in and out of studios and everything i mean yeah i mean i'm still amazed at going into studios i i still i still have a little boy teenage boy sort of fascination that i've never become jaded i like walking into a room and hearing it and hearing the studio owner's story or the engineer's story and I, and that's just been a constant. Um, I, I mean, I, I have a favorite story. Peter Gabriel. I'll tell you, all right, here's one of my favorites ever. Okay. I'm quickie. And it's, I know we're running out of time, I'm sure. Uh, I'm Irish. I'm the middle of 12 children. I talk too much. Um, <laughs> so I'm not, I, again, I'm not, it sounds, sometimes it sounds like I'm name dropping. I'm not. This is all a yeah. privilege of being the editor of yeah. Mix. I'm, a, I'm still a small town boy from Rensselaer, Indiana, who grew up with three stoplights in his hometown, you know. Um, but I had, it's Peter Gabriel, okay. And, uh, I must have been about 2000 or rather. He, he was a part of the team that bought SSL, bought mm -hmm. Solid State Logic. Right. Um, but the David Kep, Kepke, uh Video guy in the Europe, great team. Uh, SSL is a tough time for large console manufacturers and stuff. And Peter had real world, had the SSL consoles and believes that Peter's a real, but he's not philanthropist. It wasn't charity. Peter wanted it. Peter knows technology. Peter, very, very, very astute in technology. And so, so happens that my daughter, Jesse, uh, my younger one, Molly and Jesse are my daughters. And we had just seen, I always been watch movies and we'd seen Say Anything that, uh, that the movie with Lloyd Dobler, John Cusack, and the famous scene where he's holding up the uh, boom box and he's playing In Your Eyes and, uh, to his girl in the Romeo and Juliet moment. Right. And so we saw that. And then a couple of weeks later, Peter Gabriel's on tour, and uh, maybe a month later, and he's in Oakland, and I get the mixed tickets. And I'm in the 10th row, and Peter Gabriel's doing a, a concert tour in the round. And so he's driving out his fun. I mean, he had this, he had a canoe on the stage. He went around, he had a bicycle. I remember this tour and I'm in the 10th row with Jesse. Molly didn't go to that one. And I, I think Jesse liked the movie more. Maybe that's why uh -huh. I picked Jesse. And so Peter Gabriel's goes around the right. He's singing in your eyes, like right in front of us. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, it's a magic moment with your 11 year old daughter, you know? Right. And, uh, so then fast forward like two months later and, uh, I think it was Deborah Pagan, who was representing SSL, called me and said, hey, Tom, at the AES in New York on this Saturday, whatever, there's going to be a lunch. And they'd like, they're inviting two editors, SSL's inviting two editors to come to lunch in New York with uh, Peter and uh, David Kepke, or probably pronounced his name wrong. Uh, and so they, me and Frank Wells, the editor of Pro Centers, went to uh -huh. this lunch. And so I'm standing out, and I'm always... Uh, don't want to approach celebrities or anything, but we're standing out in the limousine comes in at like 1230 to the Javits Center to take us away. And, oh, hey, back up. Back up the story. That's that's the story. So I'm going to go out to lunch with Peter Gabriel. I get this call. And uh, so that Friday before I fly to New York, I, I turn to my daughter and I go, hey, Jesse. I remember her being at the iMac computer in the kitchen. I go, hey, Jesse, guess who I'm going to lunch with next Friday? She says, who that? Peter Gabriel. She paused. She goes, you better buy some new clothes, Dad. And I, <laughs> just deadpan for my 11-year-old. 11, 11 and I, I still dress like him in the 1970s. And that's, that was the hysterical moment. So I fast forward. I'm standing in the limo with Peter Gabriel to go to Midtown. And uh, I say, hi, Peter. I said, thank you. I'm the editor of Mix. And yeah, I'd like the next time. Whatever you say when you walk up to him. I go, I'd like to tell you a story, but I'm sure you've heard it a million times. Just say anything. You're my daughter. Uh, you know, Lloyd Dobler, you were in concert. 
buy some new clothes, Dad. And he laughs. We get in the limo, go to lunch. Yeah. And I'm sitting by him, and he's, and he's a, uh, and I, I, I get fortunate. He, world, he talks world politics, world music, world everything. He's a basic man. At lunch. And he asked me if I, you know, earlier, if I'd like to write something to my daughter because it was a funny story. I go, no, no, no. <laughs> Finally, lunch is ending, and I go, like, shit. Had a birthday. I had a business card, and I asked the waiter for a pen. And I said, Peter, you know, would you write something to my daughter? And um, <laughs> and he laughed because I'd love to talk. And I never told him. I, now that I, I never told him that her name was Jesse, J E S S E. But he writes, Dear Jesse, and he gets it right. It was on the back of my business, mixed business card. He says, Dear Jesse, your dad looks great in his new clothes. Peter. <laughs> over the over the tea, he puts this little sunburst with a couple of thoughts. Yeah. I, and I told, and um, my daughter still has it. You know, it's, it's a wonderful moment. And I get to, I get to fly home from the show and tell her. Yeah, hey, yeah, Jesse. And Peter, Peter Gabriel wrote this for you. You know, all within about a six month period of, from say anything to a concert at the Oakland Coliseum to, uh, by chance, going to lunch with him in New York City, and just a genuine guy. I mean, just a genuine guy. And uh, that's that's one of my personal thrills. That's and it connects my fam. It connected my family, my job, my everything. Right. And, um, Hey Jesse, your dad looks good in his new clothes because I did. <laughs> so, just a couple more questions. Uh, uh, you do a lot in film and audio post. You write a uh, lot about that. Um, what it, what interests you so much about that, and how is it different than uh, than the uh, pro audio side? Uh, let's see. Well, to me, they're all pro audio. One's music, and one's right. Uh, yeah. Don't mess me, yes. Okay. But um, uh, let me think about it. that's a good. That's a very good question, Karen. Thank um, you. What I got into it, I, I think I'd always liked movies. I think when I went to journalism school in Indiana, uh, in the master's program, you can break it down to you know, newspaper journalism, copy journalism, PI, all this. And uh, and I took reporting the arts. I was this like, oh, I want to. And so I'd take art, you know, art color theory classes, go to the art museums. I had to cover an opera. I fell asleep. I honestly fell asleep in an opera. That's <laughs> absolutely, I was like 22, probably partied the night before and <laughs> fell asleep. But, um, but I also had, uh, went to the Bluebird Cafe in Bloomington and had to write a story about a rock show. And um, yeah. I love film. I always liked movies. I remember like Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. Yeah. Like, some of my seminal movies were in 2001. Andromeda Strain, Butch Cassidy, is Sundance Kid, all these things when I was nine or ten, and I always liked movies. I think film combines a lot of visual. I've always liked uh, fine art. I've always I've, I've, uh, I enjoy uh, the impression. I enjoy impressions. I'm a big fan of Gauguin. You know, um, right. I I understand where Picasso fits in the world. You know, besides being Cubist, uh, I, all these things I've always just been a part of my life, uh, and and I think film brings a lot of them together. Uh, yeah, Phil is also, and I'm Irish. I had a grandfather, James Valentine Kenny, who was the best storyteller I've ever met. Yet to this day, nobody, nobody can tell a story like my grandfather. I think film does that. It, it brings together the visual, the audio, and so I, I fell into a strange situation where I got a call and I was able to write about the Doors movie, and it was my first big, big feature article for Mix about 1990, 91, and uh, I was able to talk with Wiley Statement, Mike Winkler. Uh, Paul Rothschild, Bruce Botnick, and I wrote a story. And it was, I guess it started with a movie about music, but it turned into a whole, I've had books and everything. It turned into something I never knew would come together in my life, but I guess film and sound sort of brings together all the things I like. Yeah. I like, yeah, I like going to music festivals and I like going to a museum to look at paintings. And, yeah. and I, think, um, I think that I've never <laughs> I'll have to, can I have a copy of this recording so I can remember to say that again? I didn't even, <laughs> I haven't even, I've never been asked that question, but that's, a, yeah, that, that might be why. Okay. So my last question, mm -hmm. do you have a favorite project, a favorite mm -hmm. event, something that you created at Mix? Uh, 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 the top, I, nothing tops tech awards, but uh, in terms of my sort of formative career thing today, yeah. though, I mean, today the world's a different place. And so the thing that I created was the sound for film. I mean, that that's it. It was a we do an event every September 
at Sony Picture Studios, the former the biggest studio in LA in Culver City, the former MGM lot has the rainbow. Uh, we work with Tommy McCarthy in the post production services, and we have the whole post production facilities, you know, with the Cary Grant Theater, the William Holden, the Novak, the uh, <laughs> I'll not forget it, the Lancaster. Um, and we and we have 800 people visit a very tight community. I mean, again, it's funny. Back to the word community. I mean, this South for film and television post production community is is magnificent. Uh, incredibly creative. Everything I like about the music world, I absolutely adore about the film and television post production world too. Streaming, gaming. I mean, I, right. I mean, sound for picture. And uh, so in 2014, uh, we were on the to do an event, and because the magazine had gotten smaller over the years, I didn't have as much room to cover film post-production but we just we could do it in an event and the way the world and the media the all well, that works uh we called Tommy mccarthy and set it up in sony and it's become very successful I had 800 some people the last year before the pandemic um karen you produce it i mean you've been a part of it and it's certainly the uh, the idea that it brings together these incredible panelists who win Oscars mm -hmm. for best sound. I mean, our keynote speakers are the Mark Mangini, who won later for Mad Max Fury Road. We have Wiley Statement, who just did Queen's Gambit, eight time, nine time nominee for an Oscar. These are big people. And we have a room with Meyer Sound's debut of their new speaker, you know. Um, and that event, has, it built every year. And then pandemic hit, we took it virtually. It was still successful. We're coming back in September and now talk about how things change. Great, successful in-person event. You get to go to Culver City for a weekend. We put on the event. It's, it's wonderful to hook up with people. Then you do yeah. it virtually. You think like, how do I do this? How the, how the hell am I going to do this? How do I recreate that? And this year, we're already planning right now for a hybrid. You know, have a limited in-person at Sony at the end of September and have a, a hybrid live because we realize if the one thing that it's taught us in the last you know, 18 months is that this will be a part of our future. This, uh, not, maybe not as many Zoom meetings or maybe not as many Google Meets, but right. reaching out to people and providing information to people and connecting with people and forming new communities. Uh, if any, any in-person event we have in the future will have a large virtual streaming community component. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's important. I think that's one thing we've learned, certainly. That, that outreach and he's able to have teams from skywalker sound and from england at our virtual event right. but i want to go back to la and i want to go back to sony and have that in-person feeling of experts in front of a crowd and manufacturers showing new product and all the good things that we do i want to gather in the church basement and sing with the choir <laughs> you know um, uh but that's that's it uh, that's that event i love that event i mean it is that world uh it's a great one yeah, it's a really, it's a really creative uh, a part of pro audio that you get these people who are also looking at picture and they have different requirements and they have uh, different needs and they have to follow a story and dialogue always has to be heard. So right. your music is limited, but it brings it all together to me. Yeah. Okay. I think on that okay. note, uh, <laughs> we're done. Not, so. Oh, Karen, I, I, I know I ramble. I, it's six o'clock. Oh my gosh. Um, but thank you. Oh, I, thank I don't, you. I've, no, and I want to say tribute to this 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 thing. Um, of all the people in Pro Audio, I, came, I started when I was 28. Karen is still my dear friend. And uh, that's, that too says some testament. I've watched your children grow up. I I, I taught Wyatt, Max to pitch pennies at Nathan, Max. I Nathan and Max, you did. Nathan <laughs> and Max. Uh, did I have one? Yeah. All right. Um, but I talked to the pitch penny, and that was fun. That was, yeah. I mean, I, watching your children grow up and everything, and still maintaining this part that I can see you at the Tech Awards and we can work together. That's um, that's a treasure to me since coming to California. So thank you, thank you for having me. Well, thank you. This has been yeah. great. All right. All right. <laughs>